DAB and online. Today we'll be discussing reports suggesting that the heir to the throne, Prince Charles, described the government's Rwanda plan as appalling. I'll be speaking to the former military commander who says the UK military is too weak to stop war or safeguard the nation. And in Campus Clash, why the Labour Party is warning the government not to pick fights with students on free speech. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. Good afternoon. It's just after two o'clock. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. The family of Sean Pinner, who was given a death sentence for fighting Russian forces in Ukraine, says they are devastated. He and another British man, Aidan Aslin, were found guilty of mercenary activities by a court in the separatist region of Donetsk. In a statement, Mr Pinner's family described it as an illegal show trial and said he should be treated like a prisoner of war with full independent legal representation. Chris Daw QC told GB News the men should be treated fairly. The truth of it is there isn't a constitution for this republic because it's not a real country. So uh, these men really should be treated as prisoners of war. They should be treated humanely. And if they are executed, it will be an utter outrage. And I really hope that everybody in the international community will do everything they can to stop that happening. Prince Charles has reportedly described the government's policy of sending asylum seekers to Rwanda as appalling. He's said to have made the comment during a private conversation, according to The Times. Clarence House insists he is politically neutral. It's after the High Court ruled the first deportation flight to the African nation can go ahead on Tuesday. Campaign groups are expected to appeal, with the case set to be heard on Monday. Conservative MP John Whittingdale told GB News he thinks the policy is sensible and meets all its objectives. Um, the people who will be sent to um, Rwanda are young males who are economically active. Uh, where there is a shortage in Rwanda, there is not a. You know, in, in this country, we have a problems being created by the level of migration in Rwanda. They want to have migrants, and the people trying to get to this country do so because they want to be economically active and to be able to earn money, which they will be able to do. So, on the basic policy. I have no great difficulty. I think it, it meets a number of objectives. The court ruling yesterday, I would hope also, is a recognition that Parliament decided that it favoured this policy, and it is for Parliament to decide and not for the courts. Well, Royal commentator Jenny Bond says Prince Charles shouldn't be compared to the Queen. For one, woke up this morning and saw those headlines and thought, good for you, Charles. That's just great. You've come up and you've said what you think, albeit privately, but Clarence House is not denying it. I think they would deny it if these conversations had not been had. And maybe Charles wanted his views to be known. He's a compassionate man. I know he is. He's a deep thinking, philosophical man of great sentiment. And I think he feels strongly about this. A man has been arrested on suspicion of murder after a teenager was stabbed at his home in Manchester. The 15-year-old boy's mother, who was also seriously injured, is now in a stable condition in hospital. Police, who've described the attack in the Miles Platting area as ferocious, believe the 44-year-old suspect is known to the victims. Brazilian police searching for a missing British journalist have found what appears to be human remains in the Amazon River. Dom Phillips and Indigenous expert Bruno Pereira were last seen on Sunday after visiting a remote part of the rainforest in São Rafael. Police are reportedly focusing their investigation on illegal fishermen and poachers. The mother of a boy with severe epilepsy is urging manufacturers to help struggling families access medical cannabis. Charlotte Caldwell says dozens of people have to pay privately to get a prescription at a time when the cost of living is soaring. She says those aged 18 or under can access treatment, but older children are being forgotten. These mothers and fathers that are nursing them are absolutely exhausted and they are having to budget really tightly um, simply because the cost of loving crisis that we're in now has really took a grip on them. So I would like to appeal to Sajid, uh, the health secretary, to extend rest gas for these forgotten children over 18. 
Calls for a new salt and sugar tax are expected to be rejected in the latest government food strategy to be published on Monday. A leaked paper suggests that ministers will leave out key recommendations from a major review. The report had called for a sugar and salt tax as part of efforts to transform the nation's diet and to protect the environment. The government is expected to accept most of the report's recommendations. Interest rates for student loans will be capped for a year to protect against soaring inflation. Borrowers were facing a 12% rate at the end of the summer, but from September that's been cut to 7.3%. The Department for Education says it's the largest scale reduction of student loan interest rates on record. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Darren. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Here's what's coming up on the show today. The first flight taking asylum seekers to Rwanda is almost on the runway after the High Court ruled the journey can go ahead. Over 30 migrants are set to be flown there on Tuesday. But the heir to the throne, Prince Charles, who's supposed to, of course, be politically impartial, has reportedly called the plans appalling. So I'll be asking, was it right for him to speak out? The latest plan from the BBC to give you what they think you want. The corporation is developing technology to encourage people to watch programmes and read news outside their comfort zones to tackle existing biases. The thoughts of Rebecca Ryan from Defund the BBC will be offered later on. And in Campus Clash this week, what university students think of the Labour Party's warning to the government to stop picking fights with students on free speech. I reckon it's time for a higher education freedom of speech bill. I actually really do agree with the government on this. But that's what we're talking about, folks, for the next hour. Your views are much more important than mine. Get in touch. Do you reckon Prince Charles was right to reportedly speak out on the government's Rwanda plan. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can watch us online on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of brilliant content on our GB News page. Cheers very much. Now, folks, Ben and Jerry's, the manufacturer of overpriced ice cream gloop has taken to Twitter to denounce Pretty Patel's Rwanda policy again. Now, most likely, tweeting from their luxurious headquarters in America's wealthy New England, liberal social media activists and, of course, their multi-millionaire bosses have sought to lecture British voters on how to police our own borders. Now, I don't know about you, right, but I personally couldn't give a flying fig what Ben & Jerry's think about the government's migrant policy. I mean, ask yourself this, what's next, right? Mr Kipling's view on housing? The Weetabix line on rail strikes? The Bisto take on the Northern Ireland Protocol? And why, why are these merchants of heart disease on a sugar rush utterly emboldened and seeking, frankly, to serve spoonfuls of sanctimonious, sensationalist, social media nonsense down our feeds. And I think it's because their ideological allies are actually winning the argument. Wealthy lefty lawyers here have been getting their own way on Britain's borders and our lack of control over them for years now. At midday yesterday, five asylum seekers currently attempting to use the courts to stop their deportation from the UK will not be sent to Rwanda. The Home Office capitulated before the battle began. They may well have done so for sound legal reasons, but it's just the first of what I suspect will be many such capitulations and defeats. And therefore, not the last time that we'll have to read the sneering tweets of Ben and Jerry's. Now, according to Home Office insiders, the chances of a flight taken off to deport illegal migrants to Rwanda is unlikely to go ahead. Lawyers claimed that the policy breached international and domestic law on seven counts, 
which wasn't accepted by a High Court judge, but looks set to be challenged further with the possibility of a hearing at the Court of Appeal on Monday. That's less than 24 hours before the flight is actually due to take off for Rwanda. And it begs the question, right, who runs this country? Lefty lawyers and their elite rich cheerleaders or British voters? Will the left-wing establishment actually allow us to do anything meaningful to stop the boats arriving and their descent into lawlessness, frankly, on our southern border? We cannot turn the boats back. That's what they say. We can't deport illegal arrivals. That's what they claim. We can't prosecute those arriving. That's what they insist time and time again. I say enough of the queue jumping, enough of the law breaking, enough of the legal activism. Enough is enough. We've been here before, though, haven't we? Remember when the Liberal and legal establishment lined up to block Brexit? I certainly do. We had Bully Burgo and his merry band of Remainers, including Anna Soubry, doing all they could to utilise parliamentary skullduggery and actually seek to thwart our democratic verdict to leave. And yes, Ben and Jerry's even got involved then. They released a series of, of statements and videos arguing that Brexit was the product of, the watchword of the moment, misinformation and should be stopped. Eventually, the lefty liberal legal action brought about a Supreme Court ruling that argued the 2019 prorogation of Parliament to get Brexit done and show Boris Johnson was serious about exiting the EU without a deal was illegal. But Boris fought the establishment and after reasserting the supremacy of Parliament and voters, frankly, at a general election, we beat the sneering elites. And I think we can do it again. With a new British Bill of Rights and maybe some court battles on the way, we can take back control of our borders. That promise of Brexit. It'll take parliamentary will, but perhaps, just maybe, we can wipe the sticky smile off Mr Bennon, Mr Jerry, and get Boris Johnson and his 80-seat majority back on track. <laughs>
at the Court of Appeal watching for the decision. And that'll be much more important and much more significant because, of course, there were some really serious, important points raised in front of the High Court. And Jonathan Swift, the judge, uh, made it very clear that there was an important decision to be made that the government should be allowed to continue its policy. After all, it was voted to do so. But he also recognised that there were some legal claims to be addressed and only the Court of Appeal could address those specific points. So I think, Darren, what we'll be watching on Monday is a much more important aspect of this bigger battle because it's 30 or 34 that I think will be challenged and given that opportunity. If they do go and it's won on Tuesday, uh, Monday by the government, then there is a greater likelihood that they will go. But then there'll be other challenges along the lines to, I think, another 70 that are currently facing those same deportation uh, letters. Jackie, is this a sign of the High Court being on the side of the British people? Well, I think what's not been understood here is this is purely an application for interim relief so that there could be greater scrutiny of the actual Rwanda migration plan. This is not the case that's dealing with the substantive matters. That case is being heard in six to eight weeks' time, we're told. I mean, obviously, court schedules don't always stick to the time. But um, this is about whether it's irrational to rely on evidence um, put forward by the government on the basis that, you know, some evidence that we've had from the government on things like Partygate and COVID and so hasn't really been accurate. And you have the lead experts in this, the UNHCR, saying that the government has misrepresented their evidence. Um, so it was based on irrationality. It was also based on some other things around um, whether reformant um, would apply and whether uh, there were issues around malaria. Um, but what the judge said, what Sir Jonathan Swift said, was that um, the government has a right and shouldn't be impinged from um, promoting its po or, 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 or implementing its policy. Um, yeah. But that some of the points are arguable. So the ground regarding uh, irrationality on the basis of whether Rwanda is indeed a safe country. And we talked about jobs or in the lead up to this program, there was something about jobs. And we know that Rwanda has no jobs. It's got a GNI that's 40 times less than ours and a life expectancy that's 10 years less than ours. There are all those issues. So those things will come up in the substantive hearing. He also found that the uh, the, the idea uh, or, the, or the evidence coming from World Health Organization about malaria is not, those are arguable points. He okay. just is not granting interim relief. And of course, he gave uh, leave to appeal and we don't know what will happen in the appeal. Jackie, a lot of people watching though today will rightly, in my view, be thinking, well, hang on, Jackie, because 10,000 people have crossed the channel this year. Surely this is the right way to actually discourage people making those perilous journeys in unseaworthy vessels. Well, but they'd be wrong because it hasn't done that. I mean, remember, the migration plan has been spoken about. Remember, it was initially leaked and then, you know, it was out in the public. It's been in the public now for about eight weeks. And in that time, the numbers have increased. So it hasn't proved to be a deterrent. Uh, okay. My own position on this is that because the Home Office themselves have told us that over 75% of people claiming asylum get it, and so therefore the majority of people, the vast majority, are genuine, um, people are going to have to come in whatever ways they can. We yeah. have this whole argument about safe routes. And yes, we could do more on safe routes, but there are always going to be people who are going to take perilous journeys because if you and your family are stuck somewhere and facing bombs or whatever you're facing, you're going to flee in whatever way. Oh, well, can. yes, but well, Jackie, I don't think if I was fleeing bombs, I wouldn't be fleeing France, would I? That's the that's the problem well, here. Well, well, but I want to ask you, Jackie, I want to ask you about many Prince Charles. Stay in France. Well, Three times uh, yeah. as many people stay in France. And we're number 14 of the Schengen list, and you add us in, we're number 14 on the list. So it's a myth. And, and actually, France pays 20 euros a week more in benefits. So it's also a myth that people are coming Well, well then benefits. why don't they stay there, then? What are they fleeing? Baguettes? You know, this is just a nonsense. But, Stephen, I well, want to ask you be, about I mean, Prince we be, Charles. We could, be, we could be ridiculous about it, but what we have is the data, and we have to look at the data. We have about 30,000 people crossing yeah, Jackie, the channel. I've got to move um, on to Prince Charles. Uh, yeah. Prince Charles, Stephen, can I ask you, do you think actually the comments reportedly, I must, it, I must stress that, right, this is just reports in the press today, but they are reporting that in private, Prince Charles has been saying that this policy, well, he fundamentally disagrees with it, frankly, ahead of the, representing Her Majesty the Queen in Rwanda. 
Do you agree that it's an absurd policy? It's a su silly and foolish comment to make by the future king if indeed he did so. It's foolish on the first hand because everybody has appreciated the queen over her reign for the way that she stepped outside of politics. She's tried to bring the nation together. She hasn't been seen to be so supporting one side or another. And for the king, future king to do this will actually start to alienate many of those who are traditional supporters of the royal family. The second thing I think is really dangerous for him is the way that this comment will be read by those in the Commonwealth, and particularly in Rwanda. By saying the policy is wrong and foolish, it also is implicitly racist towards Rwanda not being capable or good enough to actually have an appropriate deal with the United Kingdom. And this goes along with what happened when we had the recent royal uh, royal trip to, to the, to the uh, Bahamas and what the reaction of people to, there to the royal family based on the comments of Meghan Markle that the royal family was racist. This will feed into that. And, and thirdly, I think by stepping into the lines of, of policy and criticising the policy of a, uh, by the king, this doesn't set a good precedent for the royal okay. family in the future. Yeah, Jackie, uh, just we're stressing that we haven't got much time there, but do you actually feel it's right, given that we've just had that discussion where we disagree with each other, it's fundamentally, isn't it, a political issue. It's a live political issue with people on either side of the argument. So is it wrong for the future king to have actually had a say on, on what is a contentious issue? Well, I mean, he, is, he isn't the monarch, um, so he's entitled to have an opinion. Um, and there may well be some constitutional issues about him having those opinions, and I'm not a constitutional expert, um, you know, but what it shows from his own personal perspective, you take him away from the royal family, that he's saying what a lot of people are saying. And on the point about racism, you know, I was in a meeting this morning with uh, leaders from the CARICOM, that's the Caribbean countries who are going off to Rwanda for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. And this isn't about saying that Rwanda isn't a fit country or isn't the right country, because even if they were going off to say, I don't know, Grenada or Dominica that doesn't appear to have any problems at all in terms of human rights, et cetera. People are saying Britain gets about 30,000 people out of 100 million displaced people around the world. It's a very rich nation and it should be seen to be doing its part. That's the concern that people have about this. Well, yeah, I mean, we're going to have to disagree, agree to disagree rather on that one, Jackie, but that was the director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, Stephen Wolfe, and the migration and human rights lawyer, Jackie McKenzie. Now, folks, plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. In a few moments, I'll be asking, can Boris Johnson survive as Prime Minister long term, despite, of course, the confidence vote against his leadership earlier this week? Former Brexit Minister Lord Frost doesn't think so. We'll get the view of a former Labour MP who actually doesn't agree, though. Stephen Pound joins me next. But first, here's the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking to remain breezy with showers, mainly affecting northern and western parts of the UK. Let's take a look at the details. A breezy but mainly fine and dry evening to come across southwest England with plenty of late sunny spells. However, there remains a chance of catching the odd shower. Across southeast England, it will be generally dry with plenty of sunny spells, though there is also a chance of the odd isolated shower. Across South Wales, it's remaining rather windy across the high ground and generally breezy elsewhere with a mixture of sunny spells and some isolated showers. It's mostly a dry picture across the Midlands with plenty of evening sunshine on offer. It'll remain rather windy and gusty with an isolated shower also possible toward the north and west. It's a similar weather story in northeast England with strong winds, particularly over high ground. Though there will be some blustery showers, there will be plenty of late sunny spells in between. Remaining rather damp across southern Scotland with showers that could be heavy at times. However, there will be some sunny spells in between. Remaining windy though, this will ease later. For Northern Ireland, there'll be a mixture of sunny spells and frequent blustery showers, some of which could be heavy at times, the showers and wind easing overnight. The showers will continue across northern and western parts of the UK overnight, though winds will slowly start to ease. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning.
We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fact! Naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Now, folks, Boris Johnson might have survived and still, of course, holds the keys to number 10 and Carrie Simmons' lovely wallpapered hoose. But if history is anything to go by, it may not be for long. The Prime Minister has been trying to get his party back on track after winning a confidence vote in his leadership on Monday evening. But with 41% of his own MPs voting against him, his long-term future remains uncertain. Yesterday, the former Brexit minister, Lord Frost, predicted Boris Johnson has until autumn to save his job by bringing about what he called a positive new agenda. So, we're asking the question, can Boris Johnson hang on to his job or will the Conservative Party ruthlessly oust the man who won them their biggest majority since the 1980s in that last general election? Joining me to discuss this is the former Labour MP, Stephen Pound. Stephen, thank you very much for your company. Your prediction there of you disagree with Lord Frost in saying, actually, from autumn, he's potentially toast. Do you think no, Boris I, Johnson I, can turn I, the ship around? I don't think you can actually draw a line in the calendar. I, I think it's also extraordinarily interesting that uh, David Frost is now being touted all over the place as a potential leader of the Conservative Party. He letters in the right-wing yeah. press on a regular basis, and a lot of commentators talking about him. So uh, I, I'm quite sure that David Frost isn't, isn't behind this, uh, this bandwagon. It's interesting. Look, the, the, the reality is Boris Johnson will not lead the Conservative Party into the next election. The next election is nearly two years away. He, he won't do it. He can't do it. Because at the moment, although he, he looked like he'd pumped up his own tyres on Wednesday, he was absolutely buzzing with it. He simply can't survive for long, basically because he can't deliver on a couple of his key promises. He cannot deliver on controlling the borders. He simply can't. He cannot deliver on the Northern Ireland Protocol. It's impossible. He's in an absolute lobster pot there. There's no way out from that. But above all, he's got the economy. He's coming up the, the, the absence of tax cuts, the increase in petrol prices, and his latest statements today about we should grow our way you know, out of the crisis. So he's got nowhere to go. The storm clouds are gathering. It's getting worse and worse by the day. The only thing that's saving him at the moment is that the Labour Party doesn't really want to, to plunge the knife in too deep for you know, various reasons. And the other thing is the lack of an obvious successor. Now, you know and I know that it'll probably be Jeremy Hunt because he's, he's one of the few people who's untainted by the present chaos and crisis and nonsense and parties and God knows what. But 
Look at the other people, people like Nadim Zahawi, who's really getting a, a lot of head, a head of steam behind him. It's not going to be Liz Truss. It's not going to be, uh, you know, Rishi Sunak. I mean, he's just, just odd. Isn't he? I mean, it's, it's not going to be any of those people. I don't think it'll be Ben Wallace. I worked with Ben Wallace in Northern Ireland. He's a very, very good behind the scenes man. He's brilliant, but I don't think he's front and centre. So there isn't a character, there isn't a, a, a sort of Michael Heseltine to Margaret Thatcher character out there at the mm. present time. But above all, I don't see any way that Boris Johnson can survive the economic storms that are coming this way and the social crisis. The fact that he's talking about this Rwanda thing, which is risible and nonsensical, everybody accepts it. I have a horrible feeling he's going to be talking about bringing back the death penalty or something there, because he's spinning sparks off his wheels at the moment, desperately trying to somehow reconnect with those people, you know, particularly the people in your part of the world. Yeah, well, but Stephen, though, saying that the Rwanda policy is risible, I, I can understand your, your argument around that, but a lot of people watching my show today will be saying, well, Stephen, how does the Labour Party propose that we actually stop people entering the United Kingdom illegal? I mean, at the southern border of the Great Britain right now, it seems like you can come over in any unseaworthy vessel and get here and be put up in a nice hotel. A lot of people are quite aggrieved by that, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, any, anybody would be. I mean, you know, I, I dealt with this case for about 20 or 30 years. And the vast majority of the people who came to my surges were not, you know, poor farmers and people who were fleeing bombing. They were actually fit young men who paid agents. They always used to say so it's exactly. handy piece of paper, you know. From so the it agents. makes sense look, for Boris Johnson to focus on this, doesn't it? I mean, he's been no, ruled no, no, out look. before. He won London, he won Brexit, he won the general election. He keeps being priced out, but he comes back bouncing, bodacious Boris. <laughs> bouncing, but they, well, I, I think Cameron's description of him as a greased piglet is a rather good one. But look, <laughs> he, at, at the present time, if we had ID cards in this country, half the problem would be solved straight away. At the present time, you can come into this country and you can disappear into the black economy. You can disappear into car washes. You can disappear. And, you, you know, there's, there's issues of names, how old you are. We need to have ID cards straight away so we know who the hell's in. Why are we the only country in Europe that has no idea of who is actually in its country? The second thing is, let's actually work with the French ones, instead of coming up with this ridiculous, nonsensical, anti-French rubbish, is actually say, look, we're going to work together to process them in France if necessary. But the, the bottom line is, where would they go to? If we're talking about sending people to Rwanda, why the hell not a Scottish island to process them? You know, why not the Isle of Man or the Isle of Dogs? I don't care. But the, the reality is, if we're talking about sending people to be processed, we can do that anywhere. If we're talking about deportation, if we're talking about Botany Bay all over again, then Rwanda makes sense from that point of view. Although I don't think it's something that the majority of the people in this country would be happy with. Because everybody, I think, is, is with you, Darren, on the sort of general dissatisfaction. Yeah. But the minute you say to them, we're going to take Mr and Mrs X and their children and, and put them in Kinshasa, different attitude, mate. People do not want to be the country that is deporting people from Afghanistan, from Ukraine, from who knows where, to Rwanda. People just don't well, want that. But thing. that's not the, what the premise of the argument is, is it, it's, Stephen? What, what's been said here, what the Prime Minister is saying, to speak in his defence for a change, because I have been quite critical of him, I think it's safe to say, over recent <laughs> days. It, but the, the fact of the matter is, what are people escaping here? You, you say that they're from Afghanistan and all of these other places, but they're in France, Stephen, right? What are they escaping? Baguettes? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason is that in France, they cannot disappear into the economy. France yeah. has a very, very rigid system of ID cards. It has carte d'identité, which you have okay. to carry with you. You get stopped all over the place. You can't even get a flipping football match. Well, obviously, if you're a Liverpool support, you can't get in anyway. But, you know, you do have to have these ID cards. So yeah. economically, and economics is important. You're quite right. There's two things here. There's the push and the pull. The push is you don't want to be killed. The yeah. pull is you want to live a good life. You can live a better life in this country because nobody will know you're there. Well, exactly. And some people say that we're too generous, Stephen, but we'll have to have that argument another time. That was the former Labour MP, Stephen Pound. Thank you very much for your company. Now, folks, you're with GB News on telly and DAB radio. After the break, we're going to be discussing the Conservative peer and author of Viral, Lord Ridley's latest remarks on why the World Health Organization has admitted the COVID lab leak theory needs more investigation. But now it's time for a check on the news headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. It's 2.35. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. 
the family of Sean Pinner, who was given a death sentence for fighting Russian forces in Ukraine, says they are devastated. He and another British man, Aidan Aslin, were found guilty of mercenary activities by a court in the separatist region of Donetsk. In a statement, Mr Pinner's family described it as an illegal show trial and said he should be treated like a prisoner of war with full independent legal representation. Prince Charles has reportedly described the government's policy of sending asylum seekers to Rwanda as appalling. He's said to have made the comment during a private conversation, according to The Times. Clarence House insists he is politically neutral. It's after the High Court ruled the first deportation flight to the African nation can go ahead on Tuesday. Campaign groups are expected to appeal, with the case set to be heard on Monday. Critics of the government's food strategy for England have described a leaked draft as a half-baked blueprint that's flatter than a pancake. They're concerned key recommendations from a major review are being ignored, including the introduction of a sugar and salt tax to help transform the nation's diet. Campaigners also accuse ministers of goading farmers into producing more meat. The white paper is expected to be published on Monday. The mother of a boy with severe epilepsy is urging manufacturers to help struggling families access medical cannabis. Charlotte Coldwell says dozens of people have to pay privately to get a prescription at a time when the cost of living is soaring. She says those aged 18 or under can access treatment, but older children are being forgotten. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Darren will be back in just a moment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Now, folks, a team of scientists working with the World Health Organization have said that the theory that coronavirus could have escaped from a laboratory needs further investigations. But in a report released this week, researchers did admit they'd not received any new data that would allow them to better evaluate that theory. The 27-member scientific advisory group also suggested China's reluctance to cooperate marks a further blow to efforts to understand how the pandemic actually began. 
Well, I'm delighted to say that joining me now to discuss this story is Lord Matt Ridley, the science writer and author of a new book on the lab leak theory called Viral. Matt, thank you very much for your company as ever. What do you make of these findings from the WHO and their admission, actually, that the lab theory needs more investigation? Because, Matt, as you well remember, saying this at the start of the pandemic would have seen you censored online. That's right, Darren. Um, on the one hand, it's welcome that the World Health Organization has come out and said, which they didn't do a year ago, that this needs further investigation because it is a strong possibility. Um, and amazingly, three of the members of their team dissented even from that, saying we shouldn't look into it any further, which is an extraordinary thing when you think about it. Um, but it's two and a half years in, the WHO frankly, got in the way of other people's efforts to find out where this virus came from. Um, we've had zero cooperation from the Chinese in trying to find out what, what went on. Uh, and uh, it's looking stronger and stronger as a possibility that the, exactly the kind of research that was being done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and nowhere else in the world was producing the kinds of souped-up viruses of exactly this SARS-like bat-borne coronavirus type uh, that um, ended up causing a pandemic. So, you know, it's common sense that we need to be investigating this. And two mm -hmm. and a half years in, we finally got around to the World Health Organization joining the US government, the G7, the public, the general public, yeah. in saying, yes, come on, let's investigate this. Uh, it's a small step, but a good one. Matt, to what extent do you agree with me then that actually, and I think there are, there are two points to, to raise in my criticism of the World Health Organization, I think actually they've been much too focused on things like nanny state pet projects, for example, and far too little on pandemic preparation. But secondly, there seems to me to be far too much of a, of a fear, frankly, of the likes of China and a politicisation of that outfit that says well, actually, we can't look into this because it might cause political headaches elsewhere. Do you think that's fair? Well, we know that's the case because we know that in January 2020, the World Health Organization had a meeting about this and discussed whether to, to declare a medical emergency. Uh, and China said, no, you shouldn't. And so they didn't. Now, a few weeks later, they changed their mind and did declare a medical emergency, uh, but with China dissenting. So this is, you know, these are clear cases of where China does have enormous influence over the World Health Organization. Dr. Tedros, the director general, was chosen as China's candidate. He's an old friend of China when he was foreign minister of Ethiopia. Um, he's a, a Marxist-Leninist, you know, all this kind of stuff. So there's, you know, there is a real history here of China intimidating intimidating uh, the World Health Organization. It forced the World Health Organization to admit that um, traditional Chinese medicine is a uh, viable form of medicine in 2018. Well, that's eating things like pangolin scales, which wow. is encouraging the wildlife trade, which is the other possible cause of this, of this pandemic and so on. So, um, uh, yes, there is, um, there is a real issue of politicization here. Um, mm -hmm. It's got in the way of proper international investigation. I used to raise this in Parliament and say, look, can we please get Britain's unique biomedical expertise to bear on this question of where this virus came from so that we know how to stop the next one? Yeah. And I was always told, ah, we're leaving that to the World Health Organization. Well, I'm sorry, yeah. that's not good enough if they're not prepared. Well, they're not, they're, they're not set up in such a way that they can... Um, force the Chinese hand on this to just release basic information. What experiments were you doing? What viruses were in that lab? If you think that they weren't involved, then you, must, you should be the first people who want to release them. You've yeah. got 22,000 entries in, in a viral database in that lab. Um, if that proves you're innocent, release it. Well, indeed, Matt Ridley, I think you can argue that silence is somewhat deafening in this case. But with the scientists arguing with them, saying that there are significant gaps in knowledge of the, the information from China being incomplete, do you actually, as a former as a parliamentarian, Matt, do you think ultimately this is reason, this is cause enough for the international community to say... China is a bad faith actor on the international stage. 
and we need to step back in our relationship and reliance upon it? I think we have reached that stage, yes, because it's quite clear that there's been a, a devastating lack of transparency from the beginning, and that is hampering our efforts to put in place the kind of measures that we need to stop the next pandemic. For example, you know, there are two possible ways this started. One is um, uh, the wildlife trade uh, resulting in an infected trader in a market who infected his customers and so on. Uh, and is anything being done? To oh, we just lost Matt Ridley, sadly, on that last answer there. But that I thought think you've was... lost me. Oh, we did, Matt. Matt, you're back. Rejoice back. at that news. <laughs> I don't know when I got cut off, but no doubt the Chinese government was involved. <laughs> yeah, well, um, Matt, we're going to have to leave it there sadly now, but uh, people can read your fantastic book and find out more about this very topic. So, Lord Matt Ridley, thank you very much for your time. That's Matt Ridley, the science writer there. But, folks, it's now 2.45, and next up, the latest plan from the BBC to give you what they think you want. The corporation is developing technology to encourage people to watch programmes and read news outside their comfort zones. They claim they want to puncture online echo chambers that reinforce existing biases. Presumably, folks, the Europhile, London-based BBC workforce will have to read something other than anti-Brexit, anti-Boris and anti-Britain BBC takes then. Maybe it all sounds fair enough, but do you trust the BBC to direct you to the news and views that they favour. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Rebecca Ryan, the communications consultant and campaigns director of Defund the BBC. Rebecca, thank you very much for your company. Is this a positive attempt, do you reckon, by the BBC to get more of what to leave behind our echo chambers and hear both sides of the argument more? <laughs> I think... Trust in the BBC is an all-time low, isn't it? Um, you know, we had them only last week. They were planted a microphone in amongst the Extinction Rebellion uh, crowd outside the Jubilee celebrations, and they used that in order to push the uh, the narrative that the country at large was um, appalled with Boris Johnson, which, um, you know, like him or loathe him, uh, that's not for the BBC to do. So they, they, they cover up their, their masquerading campaigning as reporting, and we all see it for what it is now. So, um, yeah, does anybody trust the BBC with our data? I, I mm. really don't think so. Um, you know, they're using licensed VPA's money to develop technology, which enables them to push their own agenda even further. It's, um, yeah, no, it, it's just not acceptable. Well, I mean, given that there's no content, it strikes me, on the BBC that's anywhere to the right of Jeremy Corbyn, what are, what are they going to do for those that are in the sort of Islington bubble, Rebecca, that actually need to potentially mm -hmm. see content that speaks to, dare I say, viewers of GB News, for example? Well, exactly. Like you say, they haven't got any content that even um, satisfies... Um, at thinking outside of supposed echo chambers. So the only echo chambers they can possibly be talking about is ones that you know disagree with the BBC and trying to filter them into the right way of thinking. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it, if anything, they need to be um, developing content that actually reflects what the British people think and feel and, and how, you know, how they go about their day-to-day -day lives. But we know that's not going to happen with the BBC. So, yeah. um, you know, they, they're just literally burning licensed fee payers' money at the moment at a time where we've got a, a, a cost of living crisis. And I think mm -hmm. that's really unacceptable. Yeah, I mean, to, to, for the BBC to argue there that their job is to, you know, come up with what, we, what news we can consume and the views that they think we should hear, I find that... Just just give us the non-biased news. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Like we do at BBC, yeah. we have people on from both sides of the argument. We hear both sides. Mm. We don't shy away from it. They have exclusively one set of views on there. Now, mm. that, to me, suggests that we're not going to be able to see both sides of the argument. They'll put forward what they want us to actually be looking at. And ultimately, nothing's going to change from this new algorithm, is it? It's just a very expensive fiddle. Exactly. It's very expensive and it just it's just handing far too much power into their hands, which um, nobody trusts the BBC to, to deal responsibly with. Um, yeah, so Rebecca, yeah, I then I guess, I guess the argument some people would make, though, is 
they aren't the only organisation doing this sort of thing. You might log into your, I don't know, Netflix account, whatever it might be, and it'll come up with suggestions of, of content you might like and things like that or trying something different. So it's not overly original, this kind of algorithm, this kind of use of artificial intelligence. But is your issue with it, Rebecca, that actually it's because this is paid for through the coercive licence fee? Absolutely. I mean, this developing technology, which, as you said, already exists, it's already out there. They could just bring that technology in, but they want to develop it for themselves in order to have some kind of ownership over some unique selling point within that technology, which means that they're going to push the boundaries of the data that they're collecting and how they're trying to manipulate viewers. That's going to be something, it's going to be a new technology. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely not their place as a, you know, a public sector broadcaster um, to use license fee payers' money. Um, to develop new technology, which is not going to deliver what the British people want to see. You know, they, they, they want to be able to see content that reflects them and their lives and their views. And, and that's, the BBC just doesn't have any content like that. So yeah. how does that technology help them in any way? Well, indeed. Rebecca Ryan, thank you very much for your thoughts. It's worth noting we did ask the BBC for comment, but they didn't reply. Rebecca Ryan, that was the communication consultant and director of Defund the BBC. Now, folks, it's time for Campus Clash as I get university students or graduates together to hear their thoughts on a big topic of the week. Today, a warning from the Labour Party when it comes to free speech on campus. The Shadow Education Secretary has told ministers not to pick a fight with students and called the government's focus on free speech on campus a distraction from wider ongoing issues in society. Bridget Philipson was, the, was reacting to the introduction of the new Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill, which actually requires students, unions and universities themselves to protect free speech on campus. The bill also contains a measure to introduce a free speech champion who will investigate no platform and cases on campuses. So do we need a Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill at universities in Britain. With me now is the English student at Queen Mary University, Anna McGovern, friend of the show, and Young Voices UK lead Jason Reid. Hello, Jason. Now, Anna, can I start with you, please? What is the case for a higher education free speech bill? It's a shame, actually, that we have to have this debate and we've actually come to a point where we have to think about introducing a bill like this to protect free speech on our campuses. It's a huge shame that this has to come forward. I would personally argue that free speech should be a right across our society. But if we're talking specifically about university campuses, university as a mechanism is there to educate young people and introduce them to contemporary ideas that they may not have learned about or been exposed to before. So by shutting down free speech and deplatforming speakers from coming into university because they have views that students may not necessarily agree with means that they're not getting exposed to those views or mm. learning different perspectives. And I think uh, possibly a bill like this would be able to protect those rights and actually improve the education of students coming to university. Yeah, Jason, I've heard this time and time again on this Campus Clash segment that we've had on the show where students say to me, look, it's like clockwork, Darren. You issue an invitation to a speaker, it could be a Conservative parliamentarian, the Conservative Party, of course, winning 14 million votes in the last general election. But like clockwork, student unions are, are, have a pressure applied to them. They then have to rescind the, the invitation to host a Conservative MP. And students don't get to hear from a democratically elected official. That suggests, doesn't it? that there is a real crisis on campus as far as speech is concerned. Well, that doesn't reflect my experience at university at all, and it doesn't re uh, reflect the research that's gone into this either. There was a 2018 uh, investigation from a cross-party committee of MPs, so MPs from all parties looking into this, and uh, similar investigations since, which have all found that there are very few and far between isolated cases of uh, no platforming or whatever else you might want to call it, where the, the roots of that can be very clearly traced. I just don't buy into this idea that there's some huge free speech 
crisis on campus. I'm by no means a Labour supporter, but I think actually what they've said on this issue is probably right, that the Tories are hoping that this will be a cheap and quick and easy way to win back some young voters, whereas I think in reality they're going to find out that the reason young people are not voting Tory is because of much more fundamental issues like being unable to buy a house or uh, record high tax rates and a bit of virtue signalling here and there about free speech on campus will not achieve what they think it will. So Anna, Jason, they're saying that he actually agrees with Bridget Phillipson's comments around the government, you know, picking a war with students and actually that free speech at universities isn't an issue that they should be focusing on. I agree with you, though. I actually think that we need a little bit more robust speech on campus to actually inoculate the next generation to be more pro-freedom of speech, don't you think? Yes, and I, if I'm honest with you, I couldn't disagree more with Jason. If anything, my university experience has seen this, and many of my friends' university experience, we've seen, you know, the de-platforming de de of speakers on university campus. And, you know, even um, with statues being torn down and lecturers refusing to educate or teach their students um, yeah. because of this. And, I, and honestly, um, this has been my experience, and I genuinely think something like this would be really practical for the universities to protect their education for the students. Indeed. Jason, just very quickly, in, in a word, if you can, don't incidents with the academics like Kathleen Stock, for example, show that there is a major issue on campus where someone can actually be hounded out, potentially, of a job? Well, students and academics already have their right to freedom of expression and to invite whoever speakers they want enshrined in law. I just don't yeah, see this as the widespread in, in issue practice, that people though, that's, that's that... not happening. So we're going to have yeah. to leave it there, sadly. I could have continued that. But that was the English student, Anna McGovern, and UK leader, Young Voices, Jason Reid. Cheers for your company. Now, folks, you're watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. There's plenty more to come after a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking to remain breezy with showers, mainly affecting northern and western parts of the UK. Let's take a look at the details. A breezy but mainly fine and dry evening to come across southwest England with plenty of late sunny spells. However, there remains a chance of catching the odd shower. Across southeast England, it will be generally dry with plenty of sunny spells, though there is also a chance of the odd isolated shower. Across South Wales, it's remaining rather windy across the high ground and generally breezy elsewhere with a mixture of sunny spells and some isolated showers. It's mostly a dry picture across the Midlands with plenty of evening sunshine on offer. It'll remain rather windy and gusty with an isolated shower also possible toward the north and west. It's a similar weather story in northeast England with strong winds, particularly over high ground. Though there will be some blustery showers, there will be plenty of late sunny spells in between. Remaining rather damp across southern Scotland with showers that could be heavy at times. However, there will be some sunny spells in between. Remaining windy though, this will ease later. For Northern Ireland, there'll be a mixture of sunny spells and frequent blustery showers, some of which could be heavy at times, the showers and wind easing overnight. The showers will continue across northern and western parts of the UK overnight, though winds will slowly start to ease. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. 
join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and that the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. <laughs> Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on telly, DAB and online. In the next hour, I'll be speaking to the former military commander who argues that the UK is too weak to stop war or safeguard our nation. Terrifying stuff. As we face one of the biggest rail strikes this decade, I'll be asking should the government crack down on militant unions? And were the government right to reintroduce right to buy to give more people a chance to buy their own home? But first, here's the news with the lovely Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. Good afternoon. It's three o'clock. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. The family of Sean Pinner, who was given a death sentence for fighting Russian forces in Ukraine, says they are devastated. He and another British man, Aidan Aslin, were found guilty of mercenary activities by a court in the separatist region of Donetsk. In a statement, Mr Pinner's family described it as an illegal show trial and said he should be treated like a prisoner of war with full independent legal representation. Chris Daw QC told GB News the men should be treated fairly. The truth of it is there isn't a constitution for this republic because it's not a real country. So uh, these men really should be treated as prisoners of war. They should be treated humanely. And if they are executed, it will be an utter outrage. And I really hope that everybody in the international community will do everything they can to stop that happening. Prince Charles has reportedly described the government's policy of sending asylum seekers to Rwanda as appalling. He's said to have made the comment during a private conversation, according to The Times. Clarence House insists he is politically neutral. It's after the High Court ruled the first deportation flight to the African nation can go ahead on Tuesday. Campaign groups are expected to appeal, with the case set to be heard on Monday. Conservative MP John Whittingdale told GB News he thinks the policy is sensible and meets all its objectives. Um, the people who will be sent to um, Rwanda are young males who are economically active. Uh, where there is a shortage in Rwanda, there is not a, you know, in, in this country, we have a problems being created by the level of migration. In Rwanda, they want to have migrants. And the people trying to get to this country do so because they want to be economically active and to be able to earn money, which they will be able to do. So on the basic policy, I have no great difficulty. I think it, it meets a number of objectives. The court ruling yesterday, I would hope also is a recognition that Parliament decided that it favoured this policy, and it is for Parliament to decide and not for the courts. Well, Royal commentator Jenny Bond says Prince Charles shouldn't be compared to the Queen. For one, woke up this morning and saw those headlines and thought, good for you, Charles. That's just great. You've come up and you've said what you think, albeit privately, but Clarence House is not denying it. I think they would deny it if these conversations had not been had. And maybe Charles wanted his views to be known. He's a compassionate man. I know he is. He's a deep thinking, philosophical man of great sentiment. And I think he feels strongly about this. Critics of the government's food strategy for England have described a leaked draft as a half-baked blueprint that's flatter than a pancake. They're concerned key recommendations from a major review are being ignored, including the introduction of a sugar and salt tax to help transform the nation's diet. Campaigners also accuse ministers of goading farmers into producing more meat. The white paper is expected to be published on Monday. 
A man has been arrested on suspicion of murder after a teenager was stabbed at his home in Manchester. The 15-year-old boy's mother, who was also seriously injured, is now in a stable condition in hospital. Police, who've described the attack in the Miles Platting area as ferocious, believe the 44-year-old suspect is known to the victims. Brazilian police searching for a missing British journalist have found what appears to be human remains in the Amazon River. Dom Phillips and Indigenous expert Bruno Pereira were last seen on Sunday after visiting a remote part of the rainforest in São Rafael. Police are reportedly focusing their investigation on illegal fishermen and poachers. The mother of a boy with severe epilepsy is urging manufacturers to help struggling families access medical cannabis. Charlotte Coldwell says dozens of people have to pay privately to get a prescription at a time when the cost of living is soaring. She says those aged 18 or under can access treatment, but older children are being forgotten. These mothers and fathers that are nursing them are absolutely exhausted and they are having to budget really tightly um, simply because the cost of living crisis that we're in now has really took a grip on them. So I would like to appeal to Sajid, uh, the health secretary, to extend Rescas for these forgotten children over 18. Interest rates for student loans will be capped for a year to protect against soaring inflation. Borrowers were facing a 12% rate at the end of the summer, but from September, that's been cut to 7.3%. The Department for Education says it's the largest scale reduction of student loan interest rates on record. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Darren. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Now, folks, we're discussing over the next hour, the former top military commander, Lord West, is going to join me to explain why he thinks Britain's armed forces are too weak to prevent war or to protect the nation in the event of a conflict. We'll be discussing should the government crack down on militant unions. The Rail, Maritime and Transport Union is promising to bring chaos to Britain's railways after its members voted decisively for strike action later this month. The thoughts of former Transport Minister Norman Baker, rail expert Len Shackleton and Michael Kale, the CEO of the Nighttime Industries Association, will be offered later on. And should we actually extend the right to buy franchise? This week, Boris Johnson announced plans to extend the scheme and allow social tenants to buy their own homes. It's an idea first introduced by Maggie T back in the 1980s, but critics say the proposals are unworkable and would make the housing crisis worse. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever though, your thoughts are much more important than my big gob. Let me know what you think about Boris Johnson's plans to extend the right to buy franchise. Is it a positive move for a home ownership or exacerbating the housing crisis. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. Watch us on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of brilliant content on our GB News page. Cheers very much. Now, folks, we start this hour with strong words, worrying words, actually, from a former top military commander who says that the British armed forces are too weak to prevent war or protect the nation from major conflicts. Labour Peer Admiral Lord West, who served as First Sea Lord from 2002 until 2006, claimed the services were too small and during a debate at Westminster stressed his calls for an increase in defence spending. In response, Foreign Minister Lord Goldsmith of Richmond he actually said that the government were increasing defence spending by over £24 billion over the next four years. Well, Lord West joins me this afternoon to discuss Lord West really robust remarks from yourself there. I wonder if we might first of all reflect on 40 years ago, the, the Falklands, of course, were taken back by our armed forces defending a British territory. Do you worry, Lord West, that actually they couldn't do the same thing today? 
Um, I think that specific case of the Falklands, um, I think we would find it hard to do it, but I think we could still probably do it because we've now got the new aircraft carriers and you need to have aircraft carriers to, to do that operation. But the Argentinians are much less able to capture the Falklands now than they were back then because we've got forces in place down there and we keep a very close eye on them in an intelligence mm. way. But I think referring to the Falklands is important reference because one of the reasons we know now, because we've seen all the documents that Galtieri thought he could invade the Falklands, was they thought the British were unwilling to fight for something. And also we had decided as a savings measure to get rid of the only ship we had based down there, HMS Endurance, to make the huge savings of £16 million over about 10 years. Um, of course, Galtieri thought, well, that shows they've got no interest in this. So I'll go and invade them. The cost to us, therefore, was £6 billion and 255 men killed. That's what's yeah. happened when you don't invest in defence. Yeah, I wonder what you think, actually, Russia, the example of Russia, where we have boots on the ground in Europe. Do you actually think that this suggests that cutting the armed forces, and according to stats from Statista, there's around 148,000 personnel serving in the British armed forces currently. But that number, as you well know, has been in almost constant decline since the end of World War II in 1945. What do you think Russia and Ukraine tell us about the, the future of the armed forces or what you believe the future of the armed forces should actually look like? Well, there's no doubt that dictatorships and uh, people who wish us harm look very closely at what we're investing in defence. And Putin looked very carefully at what Europe was doing in investing in defence. And I have to say, most of Europe's been worse than we have and what we were doing about defence. And we have steadily cut our defence spending over a, a period of years, successive governments. The biggest recent cut was in 2010 when the coalition cut our military by a third. They actually cut the military by a third, a huge cut. Mm. Uh, and these things are looked at by people like Putin. And he looked at the fact we were cutting defence. He looked at statements that are made. He looked at the European money spent on defence. And he thought to himself, well, they're not willing to fight. They're not willing to stand up for what they believe in. Exactly the same as going back to what Galtieri thought. And uh, that's why it's important to keep up spending. And although uh, Lord Goldsmith referred to extra money for defence. And indeed, there was a slight uh, boost of money that came in at the end of 2020. That didn't even fill the gaps that had already been made. We have got real, real shortcomings in terms of stockpiles, in terms of the maintenance of equipment, and in terms of numbers. When I joined the Navy, there were 130 frigates and destroyers. We've now got 12 uh, frigates and six destroyers. I mean, that is pretty devastating for a maritime country. Yes, indeed. I mean, you're right in what you said. Lord Goldsmith of Richmond Park, he actually remarked that £24 billion worth of increased spending would be made over the next four years. That's the biggest investment, he says, in the UK armed forces since the end of the Cold War. So you might have some viewers who think, well, surely that's enough, no? Well, actually, I have to say, I don't think it is. The, the £24 billion, it depends how you add that up and how you work it out. Um, with inflation and all sorts of other things. Uh, it's not the biggest amount of money in terms of a boost um, since the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, well, well, you could say it is the biggest because basically we've cut continually since the end of the Cold War, both Labour and the Conservatives. And, uh, and, and this was the first time we've actually tried to start correcting. To, to say that they cut, I don't know how much, if you related it, probably something like 100, over 100 billion has been cut from what the defence levels should have been and say, gosh, we put 24 billion in, that still doesn't uh, cut the mustard, does it? You know, we have yeah. still got a real problem. Would you argue then, looking back, to go back to the Falklands reference, we see the image of Maggie Thatcher in the Union Jack being hoisted once again on that island. Do you think the Conservative Party is actually at risk of losing its image of the party of not just law and order, but the party of our armed forces as well? Well, I think what's very interesting is that, um, you know, Margaret Thatcher, uh, as soon as the Argentinians invaded and she decided, thanks actually to Admiral Leach, who was the one who stiffened her, her backbone on this issue, um, that we were going to go back to retake them, she released two and a half billion pounds from the reserve. 
That was in 1982, two and a half billion. That's a hell of a lot more in today's money. Yeah. So far, the, the current government has not actually said they'll increase anything in defence spending. And yet there's a war going on in Europe and a real possibility of there being a world war. And for us not to be investing in defence at this stage is mad. The one thing you can be sure of in Ukraine is, although they would love to have a good health service and love to have a good uh, uh, work and pensions uh, service, that's not what they're spending money on. When you've got the, the wolf at the edge of the sledge, you know, the enemy at the gates, you spend money on defence. And we need to spend money on defence because Putin will see that. He'll see we mean business. And we have then have forces that are capable of doing what's expected within the NATO coalition. Yeah, Lord West, I wonder if, it, briefly, you would say it was in my gift of I, of course, I'm not Her Majesty the Queen, but say it was in my gift to offer you the position of Defence Secretary. What would be the first thing that you would actually do? Would it be to just say, look, appeal to the Prime Minister? We must spend more money on the armed forces. Is it as simple as that? I would absolutely say more money needs to be spent. I think I'd identify some areas where it could be spent. I mean, for example, I think cutting the army down to 72,000 is a step too far. I think having the two aircraft carriers is fantastic, but you've got to have their complement of aircraft, the full complement of aircraft. The weapons of a carrier, the weapon system, are its aeroplanes. And the government have got 48 so far. They haven't invested in getting all the aircraft that are needed. And there are other areas, again, in, in terms of naval warfare, surface-to-surface -surface missiles we haven't got. In, in army warfare, they haven't got weapon stocks that they should mm. have. Um, the army uh, tanks are not redundant, Toby. We don't need big tank armies. Yeah. But to say tanks are no longer needed is a, is a nonsense. You can see uh, the amount of effort that's put into killing tanks. We see it on the television all the time. Indeed. If they weren't important, no one would bother to try and put so much effort into killing them. They are, yeah. and we need to have some. And so there are areas where we specifically need to start investing straight away. And I'm afraid, although it's not nice for a government because we're comf cosy and comfortable, the last thing people want to do is spend money on defence. The reason we are cosy and comfortable is because in the past we have spent money on defence and we're yeah. in that position. Indeed. I mean, the, the, the global picture has never looked more volatile, has it? But Lord West, thank you very much for your insight today. That was Lord West, the retired admiral in the Royal Navy. Now, folks, the UK is on the verge of one of the biggest rail strikes in the last decade, with around 40,000 members of the National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers set to walk out on the 21st, 23rd and 25th of this month. It's over disputes in pay and job losses. And to make matters worse for commuters, London Underground staff will also walk out on the 21st of June. The government is promising action, including looking at changing the law so replacement workers can be brought in. So we're asking the question today, should the government crack down on militant train unions? Well, joining me to discuss is Norman Baker, a former transport minister, Len Shackleton, a rail expert at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and Michael Kale, the CEO of the Night Times Industries Association. Len, can I start with you, please? Rail workers are saying, look, we're underpaid, inflation is sky high, I'm struggling to put things on the table in a way in which I never was in the past. So why shouldn't they actually be able to demand they get more pay and be able to strike like other sectors? They, I, obviously, uh, all workers are, are going to be stretched with the cost of living crisis at the moment. But why uh, there, there should be a special case made for, for railway workers is not at all clear. We're, you know, we spent a, an awful lot of money on keeping uh, the railways going uh, during lockdown. Um, and you'd expect perhaps a degree of gratitude for this, which hasn't been displayed by the militancy of the, the RMT. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, whatever sympathy we may have for workers, do remember that, that rail workers are much better paid than the average workers in this country. And to make a special case for them, I think, is mistaken. Mm. Norman Baker, you're a former minister. The politics of this are, I think it's safe to say, is somewhat tricky. I'm sure you've got some sympathy, to say the least. But how do you actually, or how would you, manage the calls for wage increases with the risk that that actually poses to increase in inflation and actually exacerbating the problem? 
I think the first thing to do, Darren, is to try to bring the temperature down because what we don't want is uh, the RMT presenting this as a, a political strike uh, with, with wider reasoning behind it than simply their members' interests. And nor do we want the government to have uh, see this as a way to bash the unions. We don't want a repetition of, if you like, Margaret Thatcher versus Arthur Scargill. Uh, what we want is the trains to continue running uh, with passengers on them, uh, building trade back after COVID, and we want, as far as possible, within the public realm and what public finances can afford, we want to see people pay properly on the railway. Uh, drivers are paid a great deal on the railway, but uh, the people in the RMT are probably paid less. They have had a freeze for a couple of years, and therefore I'm sympathetic to the argument that they should have a pay increase, but I'm not sympathetic to the tactics of the RMT because the RMT has gone out and said, uh, we are not going to tolerate compulsory redundancies and a wage freeze. Well, no one's suggesting that. No one has yeah. actually put forward the idea of compulsory redundancies, and no one's suggesting a wage freeze. So they're putting the cart before the horse. And to go on strike like this at a time when we're trying to get people back on trains is pulling the rug from under them, underneath themselves. Indeed. Um, Michael, what will the... I wonder if you can just paint a picture of what the economic damage from these strikes will actually be. Can hospitality afford this so soon after the COVID pandemic? Well, as we know, I think everyone's been struck with uh, cost inflation, particularly our sector after being starved of trade. Uh, things like nightclubs, bars, pubs, restaurants are in a very difficult position, very precarious. I, I, I think the biggest concern is, is as you can appreciate, is uh, getting our, our staff and, and the public home. Um, what we don't want is people feeling that if they come out of a night and they get to the early hours of the morning, they're not able to get home. And that, that's uh, got many questions around safety, um, but it, it also is potentially going to deter custom and, and that's going to impact on trade. And what we have to consider is when we're talking about staffing is additional cost with the limited rail service um, is to get these people home safely. Um, I mean, the concern that we have and what we're hearing is that the announcement with regard to the potential strike is almost a preemptive public position because um, there is still uh, the fact that they've got to sit round the table and we're encouraging them to get round the table and let's pragmatically approach this to try and get a resolution before we get to the end of the month. And festival season and, and event season really kicks off where we rely heavily on the, uh, uh, the public rail service. Now, Len, I know my viewers will be watching this and saying, well, there's a man that wasn't around in the 1970s, but you were. Do you think we're returning to that age? Oh, gosh. I actually, I quite enjoyed the 70s, but uh, <laughs> in, in terms of the, the economy, it was, it was quite a mess. And, uh, yeah, we, we've, we've got uh, inflation. What we don't want to get into is, is kind of wage price spiral, uh, which is the danger at the moment, I think, because... Although inflation is ultimately driven by the money supply, um, what we'd have to do if we got into a wage price spiral is, is really raise interest rates, really cut back on the money supply and so forth. And this would have very serious knock-on effects on the rest of the economy. So, yeah, I think we should learn the lessons of the 70s. And it's, very, it's very weird, isn't it, that the, the cabinet doesn't contain anybody who has memory of these things, which is mm. quite extraordinary, really. You don't have to be a... You don't have to be in your nineties or something to remember this stuff. You know, it's uh, the, the, the the younger generation of politicians don't seem to uh, really be on the ball about this, and I think they should be. Well, hey, I can tell you what, I wasn't around, but I certainly don't want to go back to that era, that's for sure. But that was the former Transport Minister, Norman Baker, real expert Len Shackleton, Michael Kill from the Night Times Industries Association. Cheers to them for their time. There's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we're going to be talking about a new love drug, <laughs> which some experts are actually claiming could save your marriage. But there's a warning to couples thinking of taking it. Private intimate health specialist Dr. Shirin Lakani will join me next. But first, here's the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking to remain breezy with showers, mainly affecting northern and western parts of the UK. Let's take a look at the details. A breezy but mainly fine and dry evening to come across southwest England with plenty of late sunny spells. However, there remains a chance of catching the odd shower. 
Across southeast England, it will be generally dry with plenty of sunny spells, though there is also a chance of the odd isolated shower. Across South Wales, it's remaining rather windy across the high ground and generally breezy elsewhere with a mixture of sunny spells and some isolated showers. It's mostly a dry picture across the Midlands with plenty of evening sunshine on offer. It'll remain rather windy and gusty with an isolated shower also possible toward the north and west. It's a similar weather story in North East England with strong winds, particularly over high ground. Though there will be some blustery showers, there will be plenty of late sunny spells in between. Remaining rather damp across southern Scotland with showers that could be heavy at times. However, there will be some sunny spells in between. Remaining windy though, this will ease later. For Northern Ireland, there'll be a mixture of sunny spells and frequent blustery showers, some of which could be heavy at times, the showers and wind easing overnight. The showers will continue across northern and western parts of the UK overnight, though winds will slowly start to ease. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Folks, I want to ask you a personal question. Is your marriage or relationship on the rocks? Well, don't worry. There could soon be a pill for that. An academic from Oxford says that love drugs are on the horizon, with a pill soon enabling someone to enhance their abilities to find love or to stay in love when it's getting a bit tricky. 
When referring to the hormone oxytocin as a form of antidepressant, Dr. Anna Matchin said that certain drugs can replicate the effect on the brain of falling in love. The pill could also be given to struggling couples or lovers who have just been dumped. Well, joining me now is the private intimate health specialist, Dr. Shirin Lakani. Dr. Shirin, thank you for your time today. Now, with the potential rollout between, what, three and five years being reported, what stage are we at before we get these drugs on the market? Um, I think saying three to five years is possibly a bit ambitious. Um, we're in the early stages of looking at the medications, but there are ethical questions raised by it. Um, the researchers were looking at medications such as oxytocin, which is a neurotransmitter that forms a bond between a mother and baby and is also known as the love hormone. Um, they're also looking at MDMA, which is an ingredient of ecstasy as well, to increase the feelings of love between couples. But my concerns are that should we be forcing these issues by um, messing around with the neurochemistry of the brain if those feelings aren't there to begin with? Well, indeed. I mean, that really does pose a very serious ethical question. At what time do you think the proposal is? At what time would you take this pill in your relationship? Would it be if things are getting tough? You know, he, he stopped putting the bins out when you ask him to. Do you pop this pill and all's hunky-dory? Um, see, that's the issue, isn't it? Because um, the researchers involved with this are saying that it will be used for couples who are experiencing marital difficulties under the guidance of counsellors. But even with that, I mean, if a marriage is failing to that extent where you have to alter someone's neurochemistry for them to stay with you and fall back in love with you, then isn't it time to pack it in and move on? Well, indeed, yeah. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is that this breakthrough will be perceived by many, won't it, as a, as a route to actually help seal the cracks of a crumbling marriage. But ultimately, if you ain't happy, you ain't happy. Absolutely. And I don't think that by plastering over the cracks um, artificially by changing your brain neurochemistry is going to solve the issue. I mean, I work with couples where I deal with physical problems that affect their intimacy. So, for example, I treat women with menopausal atrophy or um, couples who suffer with sexual dysfunction. Um, but these are couples who actually emotionally want to be together. Um, we're not looking at couples who are emotionally distant and trying to fix cracks. Yeah, what would your advice be to someone that is, you know, at a low in their marriage? I mean, divorce rates, of course, are going up and up and up in this country. Do you, do you actually think that's a good thing? Do you view separa regu more regular separations as a good thing because it's people being seen to actually utilise their personal choice? Um, I think there's two sides to the story. I think um, one issue is that um, we're becoming less tolerant and we're less willing to put up with things. So people might see separation as a quick fix to um, end a relationship that's not working. Um, but there is the aspect of if you're not happy with who you with, you do have the choice to move on as well. And we're living longer. Um, we're in a situation where actually people aren't expected to be in monogamous I'm sorry, monogamous relationships for the whole of their lives. So moving on, having more than one partner is probably more natural now. Yeah, I mean, I'll be interested to see what my viewers say to this one because it all sounds very exciting, doesn't it? But as you well say, there are certain ethical questions that have to be answered mm -hmm. and debated around the use of these drugs. But private intimate I mean, health specialist, Dr. Shirin Lakani, thank you very much for your time. Now, folks, is are with GB News on telly and DAB radio. I thank you for your company. Next, on Tuesday night, the German men's football team took the knee with the England team as a show of solidarity with the three Lions. It follows Gareth Southgate's men being booed for taking the knee before their game with Hungary. The political tension within the sport adds to the row over whether the World Cup should actually be held in Qatar this Christmas. We'll be discussing that and what I call hypocrisy, frankly, by footballing elites. But now it's time for a check on the news headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. Good afternoon. It's 3.33. Here's the latest from the GB newsroom. 
The family of Sean Pinner, who was given a death sentence for fighting Russian forces in Ukraine, says they are devastated. He and another British man, Aidan Aslin, were found guilty of mercenary activities by a court in the separatist region of Donetsk. In a statement, Mr Pinner's family described it as an illegal show trial and said he should be treated like a prisoner of war with full independent legal representation. Prince Charles has reportedly described the government's policy of sending asylum seekers to Rwanda as appalling. He said to have made the comment during a private conversation. According to The Times, Clarence House insists he is politically neutral. It's after the High Court ruled the first deportation flight to the African nation can go ahead on Tuesday. Campaign groups are expected to appeal, with the case set to be heard on Monday. Critics of the government's food strategy for England have described a leaked draft as a half-baked blueprint that's flatter than a pancake. They're concerned key recommendations from a major review are being ignored, including the introduction of a sugar and salt tax to help transform the nation's diet. Campaigners also accuse ministers of goading farmers into producing more meat. The white paper is expected to be published on Monday. The mother of a boy with severe epilepsy is urging manufacturers to help struggling families access medical cannabis. Charlotte Caldwell says dozens of people have to pay privately to get a prescription at a time when the cost of living is soaring. She says those aged 18 or under can access treatment, but older children are being forgotten. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Darren will be back in just a moment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own news from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Now, folks, on Tuesday night, England drew against the Germans in Munich in the Football Nations League. But the game once again raised questions about the, the politicisation of England's football team. They continue, of course, to take the knee, but will still take part in the World Cup and travel to Qatar, a country that's absolutely riddled with human rights abuse questions. So I'm asking the question today, are England at risk of looking like rank hypocrites? Well, joining me to discuss is the sports writer for The Sun, Justin Allen. Justin, thank you very much for your time. Do you reckon England are at risk here of looking like hypocrites? 
It's a very good question. Um, I, I mean, obviously, um, you, you know, the, the England football team, you know, is a unifying force. It brings yeah. people together uh, and we can all get around, you know, what true values are, what, what shared Oh, we just lost Justin Allen's audio there. My view on that, on the, the football question, I think Justin Allen was absolutely right in what he was just saying, and we'll try and get him back. But I think in what he was just saying, that the England team is a unifying force. But actually, I think that taking the knee is a really divisive act, and they still continue to do it. So there we are. But now we're going to go to... Oh, have we got Justin Allen back? Let's go... We'll move on to Grime Watch and come, hopefully come back to Justin Allen. But Grime Watch is the part of the show, as you know if you've watched my show before, where we look at what you at home have been saying about the biggest trends and topics making the headlines. Now, following the vote of no confidence earlier this week, I took to Twitter stating that no matter how naff Boris Johnson turns out to be, Labour still remain the party that did this. And for our, my radio listeners, there is Sir Keir Starmer taking the knee and his deputy, Angela Rayner, next to him taking the knee as well. The ultimate act of virtue signalling. A lot of you got in touch about this very issue, so let's have a look at what you had to say. Andrew said, they say this has shown solidarity, but what has all of this knee bending achieved? Well, exactly. If you remember that summer, that first lockdown that summer, where we had wanton acts of criminality in the name of so-called equality. It was utterly deranged. Isaac says, taking the knee should be against any form of prejudice or racism, but instead it's used purely for racism against people of colour, like no other form of racism is valid, it seems. And Danny added, I'm getting tired of this photo, can we please ban it? Well, Danny, you see, the reason I shared it is because I think people do, and this is perhaps just to, to goes to show how fast the political cycle moves, but people forget things very quickly. And I think it shows that Sakia Starmer is one of these politicians that'll get on board with any wackery and wokery cause that he can lay his hands on to make him look popular to Twitter instead of the likes of Hartlepool in the northeast of England. But Chris said, could you imagine, even for a second, Johnson showing anywhere close to that level of solidarity and social awareness? Well, I think that's unfair, Chris. I really, really do, because I don't think the act of taking the knee is actually a show of solidarity. We in this country enjoy fantastic race relations. I think we in this country are a country where you can be proud to fly the Union Jack and know that it represents equality in law and in wider society. But that's just my view. Now, folks, we were just talking about the England football team and asking if they're at risk of being hypocrites as well. We can now go back, thankfully, to the sports writer for The Sun, Justin Allen. Justin, I do apologise for losing you there. You that's were okay. just giving me your response to the question, are England at risk of looking like hypocrites? Well, they certainly could be. Um, I, I mean, in terms of taking the knee, obviously it's been going on for a couple of years now. I'm not a big fan of going to a football match and, you know, having people preach to me what I should think. Um, and I, I'm not a big fan of slogans. I think the interesting thing is going to be we've got the World Cup coming up, obviously, in the winter, where, as you just highlighted earlier, you, you know, has got an absolutely, you know, Qatar, I've got an absolutely horrendous human rights record, uh, obviously, um, you, you know, homophobic, uh, transphobic. Um, are we going to make a stand when we go out there? I mean, we're obviously going out there. I, I think, you know, we're, we're very full of doing all these gestures, uh, wearing T-shirts, kick racism out of football, all this sort of stuff. W wouldn't it be nice if the England football team, actually, when we're out in Qatar, perhaps can wear something with an anti-homophobic message on their shirts in a country where um, it's illegal to have, you know, same-sex relationships? Yeah, because, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at the FIFA.com Twitter account right now, and they've, of course, got the the pride flag plastered all over their branding. And you just think, right, you've got the likes of, of David Beckham and all of these others celebrating the fact that we're off to Qatar. And you just think, my God, two minutes ago you were preaching from the gospel of equality and all of these other things. I wouldn't feel comfortable walking around in Qatar, would you? 
Well, no, certainly not. Um, I mean, I don't know if you saw the report, Darren, like I did in the week, uh, that a Swedish and Danish journalist um, phoned up 60 hotels in Qatar asking could they stay exactly, yeah. during the, the World Cup. And, and, and you, you, you know, and I think 20 expressed concern. Um, there was a couple that actually said, no, you're not welcome. And one outrageously suggests... Do not dress gay. I mean, you just could not make that sort of stuff up. I mean, also the Emir, the nation's leader, said he wants people to enjoy the football, but but at the same time respect their culture, which translates there. And as you can't be openly gay during the tournament, but I think a World Cup is a festival of not just football, but also a festival of cultures. And in staging event, those nations should respect others too, and certainly people's basic human rights to love who they damn well want to. Yeah, well, indeed. I mean, I guess the I would argue that Qatar have got an absolute right to put in place whatever policy they want to. But actually, we also should have the right to say, well, we're just not going to host the World Cup there. It's as simple as that to me. Yeah, I mean, having the privilege of stage in such a prestigious global event, it should be about upholding basic human rights and shared values across football. And as we say, you know, two people loving each other, regardless of sexual orientation, should not be hidden away. Um, they've signed up to stage a global event where they're going to be hosting a whole diverse range of cultures. And all those cultures should be welcoming Qatar. If they're not, then, you know, they don't have to stage this event. Yeah. I mean, Justin, then, what was the performance like from England? Do you actually think it was something worth celebrating, moving away ever so slightly from waggery and walkery? <laughs> um, I mean, England, I mean, obviously, the, the Hungary performance was, was very poor. We just did not show up at all. The, the German game, we were very poor in the first half, played better in the second half. I kind of feel like there's a little bit of a burnout at the moment, Darren. I mean, we had mm. the pandemic, obviously, and then a lot of games got crunched into the end of that season. That went. Sh there was a short turnaround into the following season that then went straight into the Euros. Obviously, we had a fantastic run to the final. There was then another very short turnaround into the season we've just had. Did they really need to, did UEFA really need to stage these Nations League games this summer? I think really footballers should be resting at the moment because they're going into this season again where it goes straight into the World Cup. I think there's a lot of burnt out players at the moment. Um, so I think it's very difficult to judge, you know, you know on, on these matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, well, Harry Kane, has he still got it? <laughs> he certainly has. I mean, it's 50 goals now. Um, he just needs four more to overtake Wayne Rooney's record as the all-time record goal scorer. I mean, he's brilliant, Harry Kane, I have to say. Uh, he's, he's an all-round player. And I'm actually going to say, and this might upset you, Darren, I think he's a better all-round player than Newcastle's very own idol, Alan Shearer. God, God, well, that's quite a claim. That's your mighty claim. I was just looking at, there's pictures there for my radio listeners of Kieran Trippier, and there's a man after my own heart. I'll tell you that much for free. But sports writer at The Sun, Justin Allen, thank you very much for your insight on the Qatar World Cup. Now, folks, it's um, 3.46, and it's time for a new section. Five a day, five things that you need to know this Saturday. Joining me to run through the stories is the columnist and conservative writer, Charlie Peters. Charlie, thank you very much for your company. First of all, we'll start with the government's new anti-woke inequality advisor saying that actually we need to send our Oxbridge, we need to end rather our Oxbridge fixation to actually ease social mobility. What did you think about that? Um, strange comments. I think we should be very proud of the best universities we've got. And I think there is, of course, uh, an excessive focus on certain universities. Oxbridge, of course, takes the pick of the bunch there. Um, but, I mean, look, we should be proud of greatness. And Oxford University and many of our other universities at the top of the leaderboards are great. So, you know, I appreciate there's a need to focus on apprenticeships and alternative ways into work. But Let's not do that by bashing some of the greatest assets we've got. Yeah, indeed. I, I think that's right. And I, I, you could argue, of course, these once august institutions are probably debasing themselves, Charlie, without uh, just some new social inequality advisor actually coming along and doing it for them. But second of all, I was looking at this Prince William story, right? He was spotted selling the big issue in, in central London. Now, some of my viewers have said, well, why is the Prince feeling the need to go out and do this? Do you actually think it was a good thing to raise issue for an important cause? Absolutely. And this is, I think, 
precisely the kind of behavior that we actually want to see from our working royals. We want to know that they're in touch with the problems facing Britons today without being involved in the political solution or lobbying for how we fix these things. So um, showing that he's aware of the suffering that unfortunately thousands of Britons endure with the yeah. housing crisis we have and the homelessness this causes is perfect. Yeah. I mean, look, for a future king, you, aren't, you can't ask for more. Build some houses, Charlie. I couldn't agree more. Now, third up, the, the world's biggest four-day work week pilot has kicked off in the UK. Do you actually think this is the future of, of work? I mean, I'm not convinced. I would love to live in a world where four days is just as productive and earns you just the amount of money as five days. But I think we are several decades away from that. Um, real wages are set to be the same in 2026 than they were in 2008. The OECD is saying that Britain's going to have a 0% economic growth next year. Um, I would love to work less and earn more, but Britain's economy isn't growing. Um, and it's, I think, not a good idea to work less when your economy is stagnant and there's so much more to do. Exactly. Fourth then, Charlie, you are someone who I think it's safe to say is proud to serve under the banner of Her Majesty's Armed Forces, for example, but how do you actually feel about Prince Charles's comments on Rwanda? Are you worried as someone who is naturally in favour of the monarchy? Are you worried that it sort of demystifies that magic of monarchy? Yes, I think we were just talking about Prince William being involved in issues without being involved in policies, and uh, Prince Charles goes too far the other way. You can basically tell what Prince Charles thinks about any new story as soon as it appears, because over his career as a working royal, he's often let you know it starts. Um, this, uh, this is unfortunate because, of course, it, it puts political pressure on the institution, but it also, um, I think it debases what it means to be a royal, which is to serve the country without trying to work for us in that way. Yeah. And just finally, the Tory MP Heather Wheeler has described Blackpool and Birmingham as god awful. She later apologised. I mean, what can people not make jokes? I've, it strikes me that this wasn't meant to be taken so seriously. But of course, Twitter.com has exploded like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, we all, we, the same people who are, I think, haranguing her and going insane over these comments will also in the same breath say something like, oh, I wish our politicians were more honest and spoke more freely. But we're completely visceral and, and aggressive when it comes to any political statements. Anyone who tries to show a bit of character, a bit of humour, a bit of fun, quite frankly, we just uh, attack them so strongly. And so you can't have it both ways. If we want our politicians to be more like us, more loose and more fun, then we need to also show them, you know, a little bit of caution in how we respond to them, trying to be a bit more entertaining. Well, indeed. But as soon as Heather Wheeler comes for Durham, that's it. I'm on, I'm on Twitter.com quicker than you can see. I don't know what. But that was the Conservative writer and columnist Charlie Peters taking me through my five a day. Thank you very much. Now, folks, the popular right to buy scheme is back in the news. This week, the Prime Minister announced new plans to allow 2.5 million people, rent and tenants, to, to actually purchase their homes outright from housing associations. This new scheme will allow individuals to use their housing benefits to actually help them get on the property ladder. So was Boris Johnson right to bring back right to buy? Well, joining me is the second year law student at Bristol University, Jules Chan, and the school governor and councillor, Jude D'Alessio. Jude D'Alessio, can I start with you, please? Would extending the right to buy franchise increase the strain on the, the housing crisis, which, as you know, is pretty pronounced at the moment. Um, I think it will do quite the opposite, frankly, Darren. I think this is a, a great announcement uh, from the Prime Minister. I think overdue, it was announced in the 2015 Conservative Manifesto under David Cameron. Of course, Prime Minister announced it a few days ago. Look, there are two and a half million tenants in this country who rent their homes from housing associations. They are currently excluded from the original right to buy scheme, which of course targets uh, council houses owned by local councils. So to me, this is simply uh, extending what was, of course, a great scheme. I think it turns, at least helps to turn generation uh, rent into generation buy and is great for first time yeah. buyers in getting their first uh, foot on the, on the run of the property ladder. 
Yeah, I'm Jules uh, Chan there. The, the right to buy scheme, right, if I consider anecdotally and on a very personal level, my mother bought her council, her ex-council house under right to buy. That transformed her life, right? She had an asset to actually protect its security and an asset to pass on to her children. The social power that it actually gives people, it powers people at, the, at a very local level, that's surely a good thing, isn't it? I think we have to kind of balance the whether whether or not we want to help those within social housing and whether or not we want to help those who are attempting to get into social housing. I mean, consider that every property sold is going to be a property outside of the safety net that provide kind of housing for the most vulnerable in our society. Considering that the one-to-one -one replacement scheme that Boris announced concurrently with that is basically a target, and then later consider that the government has failed to reach its target to construct new homes consistently for the last three years, let alone social homes. And it kind of paints a very grim picture of what we're looking at with this policy. Yeah, Jude Delasio, can in a sentence, if you would, do you actually think that the, the focus, as, as uh, Jules said there, do you actually think that the focus should be on building affordable housing and actually combating pressures on the housing sector, like mass migration, for example? I think that's a very good point. Um, and also, to be fair to the government, is doing that. They are reviewing um, uh, access to mortgage finance for first-time buyers, perhaps things like 95% mortgages. Uh, we, of course, have shared ownership. So I think really right to buy is a uh, perhaps a small portion in a whole range of measures uh, to tackle those issues. I think Jules uh, raised some good points about meeting the targets. I'm optimistic. I hope we meet them. And I think this is a very welcome development and long may it live on. Jules, very briefly, if you would, if you just want to respond to that. I think Jude is um, correct in saying that perhaps if this was part of a more holistic plan, then it would work. But unfortunately, I'm not kind of seeing the kind of holistic nature that he's kind of portraying here. I kind of think that this is something that needs to be elaborated on if this is something that, was, that is going to have to work. Well, we'll see. I just think build more houses and the policy would work absolutely fine. But you have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. This show is on every Saturday and Sunday at two o'clock. But for now, I'll leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking to remain breezy with showers, mainly affecting northern and western parts of the UK. Let's take a look at the details. A breezy but mainly fine and dry evening to come across southwest England with plenty of late sunny spells. However, there remains a chance of catching the odd shower. Across southeast England, it will be generally dry with plenty of sunny spells, though there is also a chance of the odd isolated shower. Across South Wales, it's remaining rather windy across the high ground and generally breezy elsewhere with a mixture of sunny spells and some isolated showers. It's mostly a dry picture across the middle.